If you would like to support the podcast, you can click the Buy Us a Coffee link on our show notes or on our website. Your support helps us keep the podcast going, and we appreciate each of our listeners so much. You can also rate and review us on Apple and Spotify, follow us on social media, and don't forget to tell your friends and family about us. I'm Darlene. And I'm Melody. This is Hard Hard Times Times and and True Crimes. There's long been a division between conventional and alternative medicine. It's not uncommon today, and it wasn't uncommon a hundred years ago. Sanitariums began to pop up in the U.S. in the mid to late 1800s. Fueled by the tuberculosis epidemic, many patients would be sent to a sanitarium or a sanatorium for recovery. These two words are used interchangeably, but there's a small distinction. Sanitarium comes from a word meaning health whereas sanatorium comes from a word meaning to cure or to heal. But either way, there was a time when people would flock to these health centers for various medical or not-so-medical treatments. Many sanitariums were luxurious health resorts for the rich where they would go to receive spa-like services, and others employed some treatments that were downright weird. Take, for instance, the Battle Creek Sanitarium, run by the notorious Dr. John Kellogg. It was one of the premier wellness destinations in the U.S. The rich and powerful would pay big bucks to go and be subject to such remedies as dietary restriction, no meat, no alcohol, but the famous cornflake cereal created by Dr. Kellogg and his brother were encouraged and they were instructed to chew each bite 40 times before swallowing. No smoking, abstaining from sex, and it's reported Dr. Kellogg remained celibate throughout his 40-year marriage. I'd be surprised if his wife did. Electric currents delivered directly to the eyeballs. Continuous baths lasting weeks and even months. 12 to 15 quart enemas yogurt enemas and beating and slapping machines and it's into this world that the female osteopath named linda hazard carved her own little niche of health cures she claimed to have the answer to whatever health problem you were dealing with and it all had to do with your gut and the simple cure involved employing some rather extreme methods of her own One of the big health fads for today is Mm -hmm. intermittent fasting. Yep. I'm sure everybody's heard of that by now. Done it for menopause. (laughs) Yes, that's what I was going to say. If you're in menopause, and I think a lot of our listeners are probably close to that point or (laughs) past that point, um, then you know that middle age spread and you try everything, right? It's a struggle. And so, yeah, I've done intermittent fasting and it's really good. It's good for blood pressure and blood sugar and glucose and all the things, your memory. Yep. They say with your muscle and fat composition, just lots of stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, the idea is that when the body goes without food for a certain amount of hours, it exhausts its sugar stores and switches to burning fat. Mm -hmm. They call that metabolic switching. So you're using your fat for energy instead of glucose. Okay. Yep. And you're probably wondering what that has to do with today's episode. Yeah, Yeah. I am. (laughs) So some swear by it. Others say it's just another weight loss gimmick. Some studies have shown that it does definitely have benefits. But as with any new fad, it's wise to seek the help of a health professional. Sure. That's the case today, and it's always been the case. But a word of caution, choose carefully which health professional you consult. Okay. And with that, let's start our story. All right. Born in Minnesota in 1867, Linda Burfield was the oldest of seven children. She married young, maybe not so young for that time period, but she was 18. Some sources state that she had two children, and others I found only listed one son. But either way, 13 years into the marriage, she left her family and filed for divorce from her husband. 
She left her kids? Mm hmm. Okay. She traveled to Minneapolis to pursue her medical studies and a career in alternative medicine. Mm. And she did indeed manage to become licensed to practice medicine, although the title of doctor is questionable. Okay, my mom, do you know that she is getting hurt? Yeah, she's studying alternative medicine right now. Oh, this will be an interesting uh, story for yep. her. Maybe a word of caution. Yeah, I, I trust your mother a lot more than this lady that we're going to talk about today. <laughs> okay, and I'm sure your mom is not going to claim to be a doctor. Oh, no. But here's what happened. Due to a loophole in the uh, law in Washington State at that time, she was actually allowed a medical license under the alternative path, although she didn't have a medical degree at all. She mm. very much considered herself a doctor, though. Okay. But in reality, her training was only as an osteopathic nurse. After her divorce from her first husband, she met one Samuel Hazard, a graduate from West Point, and they fell in love. They married, but unfortunately, he had not actually divorced one of his previous two wives. Oh, he was a bigamist. Yes. And he ended up being imprisoned for two years for the crime of bigamy. While they were married? Yes. Okay. But after he was released, the couple decided to head to Washington to start life anew. She was where, forgiving. Where she began to practice in Seattle. She would commute from there across Puget Sound to her place in Olala that she called Wilderness Heights. Later, the locals would end up calling Wilderness Heights Starvation Heights. Oh. After some of them caught wind of her methods. Okay. There are reports that the neighbors sometimes came across starving patients who were trying to get away from the place. Oh, my goodness. And they would ask for help. Crazy. She, her, yeah, it is crazy. It reminds me of the poor ladies that got waterboarded in the yeah. shark episode. Right. Poor were brutal. Yeah. Linda had hoped to build a grand sanitarium there one day when the funds were available. But for now, she, she does have some land out there and she's practicing, you know, from her home and that kind of thing and traveling over. But she doesn't have the great big building yet. Okay. Linda Hazard had studied under another well-known doctor at that time who was a proponent of fasting. And she went on to develop her own fasting cure-all. She began spreading word of her cure. And eventually she wrote three books about the fasting cure, the science behind it, all the ills it would cure. That first book, published in 1908, was called Fasting for the Cure of Disease. She proposed this cure would cure everything from toothaches to tuberculosis. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Now, this was during the time that any alternative cures were considered quackery mm -hmm. and faddest. It wasn't taken seriously at all by the medical community. Okay. Now, today we do know that alternative medicine has its place for sure. sure. And there are some benefits to fasting. Absolutely. But maybe not the way she did it. Right. <laughs> Which we'll talk about. And with such incredible claims of what her cure could heal, like, you know, tuberculosis and a toothache, it does sound rather fanciful. Right. But there were people who bought her claims. They believed she had the answer to good health. Many of the people that went to her, they had power and wealth. And they believed heartily in her unorth unorthodox methods of treatment. And so they would willingly subject themselves to, quote unquote, the cure. And this is how the Williamson sisters found her in 1911. In February of 1911... Two sisters in their 30s, Dorothea and Claire Williamson, were traveling the world. They were currently in Victoria, British Columbia, preparing to go to California for some weeks of some sunshine and some relaxing before they intended to split up. One was going to head to Australia and the other was heading back to England. One day, while they were leisurely resting at their current luxurious hotel, Claire happened upon an ad in the newspaper promoting Dr. Linda Hazard's book, the one we just talked about, Fasting for the Cure of Disease. Mm -hmm. Hazard had also released a brochure promoting her new sanitarium, the Institute of Natural Therapeutics in Olala, Washington. The sisters, who both had their own various ailments and whom some would maybe call hypochondriacs, were definitely interested in the treatment center. And money was no object for them. The ladies were daughters to a rich father, who now had passed away, leaving them in charge of a rather large estate. 
actually one of the reasons they were on this world traveling right now is that they were looking for ways to invest some of their holdings. Dorothea, who went by Dora, was 37, and her ailments consisted of rheumatism and indigestion. Claire, the younger 34-year-old sister, had been told she had a dropped uterus, and they both figured this place was the place for them to remedy those ailments. Okay, yeah, I've heard about the dropped uterus thing. (laughs) Well, that would cause apparently mental problems. Ah, yes, we've (laughs) talked about that before a little bit. After some back and forth between the sisters and Dr. Hazard, arrangements were made for the ladies to put themselves under her care. While they had paid some visits to their uncle and other family members in California and closer areas, they did not mention their upcoming visit to the sanitarium. They knew most of their family did not agree with their natural health remedies Mm -hmm. that they followed. You know, they thought they were just a bit strange. Right. As they were. Yes. (laughs) So they kept their visit like on the DL. Okay. Let's just keep that on the down low and don't tell uncle that we're going. I have a funny story to add here, okay. Darlene. Have you ever heard of an iridologist? No, I haven't. An iridologist is someone who looks in your eyes, uh-huh. and according to the pattern in your eyeball, they <laughs> <laughs> you get a diagnosis. Yes, really. Yes, and one time, and this is probably been twenty years ago. It was kind of like a fad here in our town. We had one in our town, mm-hmm. so I went. And she looked in my eyes. She took a picture of my eyes. It was all, uh, she blew it up really large and Mm -hmm. told me I had appendix troubles. And so she prescribed me this supplement that she sold, which was costly (laughs) to take, which when you drank it was the worst taste. It was like drinking um, grass, liquid (laughs) grass from a field. It was nasty. Did you believe it at the time? I didn't really, but I thought, you know, we'll just see. We hope it works. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So then she told me also what I needed to do was get on some stairs Mm -hmm. head first and slide down the stairs several times. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, oh my that's where I draw the line. I'm not doing that. That is ridiculous. <laughs> that so, is hilarious. According to her, my appendix was going to rupture, you know, at any time. But that was about 20 years ago. And I still have my appendix. And if it ruptures after I do this episode, I will come on here and correct myself. <laughs> That is so funny. Crazy. Slide. So what was that supposed to do? I guess. Like put it back in place? Or no, because that's not. Well, it was supposedly inflamed. I don't know what that was. Yeah. Maybe release toxins from it. Who knows? I mean, it's just, it's crazy stuff. Yeah. If you're listening and you go to the iridologist, I apologize. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe they're not all crazy. Maybe. I don't know. Sounds kind of (laughs) crazy. Well, well, I find it funny, but. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, Back to our story. Okay. The two sisters arrived in the state of Washington in February 1911. Upon arriving in Seattle, they were told that the sanitarium was not actually finished yet, so they actually had to get set up in an apartment there in Seattle to begin their treatment. Okay. For the cost of $60 a month each, both ladies were treated with the following fasting protocol. No food except for fruit juice, vegetable broth, and asparagus water. Liquid fast. Liquid diet, yep. In addition, they would receive vigorous massages and a warm bath daily. They would go to the doctor's office twice a day for the massages, but would otherwise adhere to the fasting regimen prescribed on their own. Okay. Oh, and an enema daily using between four to six quarts of warm water. What? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That sounds a bit uncomfortable to me. Yes. Especially if you're not eating. Yeah. Like, I mean, you'd lose a lot of weight pretty quick. Yeah. Ugh. Well, they did. After just two weeks on the regimen, the girls were in such a state of malnutrition that they were too weak to even visit the doctor at her office. So the good doctor sent a nurse to them at the apartment to help care for them. Obviously, the girls were suffering and losing weight quite rapidly mm-hmm. by this point, And they were growing weaker and weaker. And back then, people weren't as big. I mean, they just weren't as big. I don't feel like as they were only. Are today. They were only uh, like, and they weighed in like the one twenties. Oh goodness! And so they were losing weight from yes. Oh, and I'll no. talk about. I'll get to more details about that in, here in just a second. They, but they believed heartily in this cure, and so they continued following oh. the regimen. Now, while this was going on, Doctor Hazard would visit the sisters at the apartment, and often while she was there, she would inquire about their important papers, their money. 
Their, oh my goodness. Yes. Their business holdings and their other valuables. And she also inquired about their other living relatives. Wow. And these poor ladies did not see through that. No. And finally, she told them that their valuables really were not secure at this apartment. And she persuaded them to give them to her for safekeeping. They agreed Mm -hmm. and they handed over to her their jewels. Oh, my gracious. Thousands of dollars worth of jewels and even gave her the rings right off of their fingers. What the heck? I know. Don't you feel bad for them already? Yes. And they're so young. Like to me. Well, they're in their thirties, which yeah. now to me that seems young, young now. Yeah. I think they were though past the age of being so gullible. Two months after they arrived, the girls, seeming to be in worse health than ever, were finally told they were ready for the sanitarium. They were moved there on April twenty second, nineteen eleven, but by that time were in such bad shape they couldn't even walk. Okay, so was this her sanator- sanitarium? Yes, she finally had it finished. Okay. So they had to be transported by stretchers and an ambulance to the new facility. Interestingly enough, while they were waiting in the ambulances to make the journey to the facility, an attorney was summoned. He -hmm. arrived with a codicil to their will that Claire signed, leaving an annuity to the Institute of Natural Therapeutics. Okay, why did she do that? It could be that she was in such a weakened condition. You know, you can't really, your brain doesn't work yeah. right when you're really sick. It could have been fine print and maybe she had no idea what she was signing. Right. Or and who knows, you know, master manipulators know exactly what to say to get you to do what you, they want you to do. So who oh, knows what yeah. she was told. And they, these ladies thought they were getting a cure. And instead, it seems so obvious what was going on. I know. Well, furthermore, Claire, in a handwritten note, also instructed her bank in British Columbia to transfer the balance of her account to Mrs. Linda Hazard. That was approximately $1,000 because they had they also had funds in uh, many other banks. That was just that $1, one. $1,000, though, back then. Was a, was a lot of a money. A lot of money. Mm-hmm. This was not nearly the whole of their estate. But okay. that was not the end of the, the directives that they left either. Oh, it gets goodness. worse. Okay. Under the care of Mrs. Hazard... Both of them continued to decline. They soon did begin to realize, I say soon, but it took a while. They realized that they had gone from just a few little minor health complaints to being too weak to even care for themselves. Okay, so they started to wise up. They did. They started worrying. Um, They were starting to really doubt the effectiveness of this fasting cure. And they actually did express their doubts. And they would ask for food many times, only to be refused and told by Dr. Hazard that the poison was not out of their system yet and that to stop the treatment now could be fatal. And they were too weak probably to just get up and leave. They could not. You know, they couldn't even walk to get to the facility. They had to be transported. So, yeah, they couldn't even That's walk insane. at this point. Now, I told you they had not been big to begin with. They were only weighing in the 120s. So you can imagine they actually by this point had lost Half of their body weight. What? Yes. Half of their body weight. Oh, my goodness. So they weighed like... In the 50 to 60 pound range. Oh. Like skeletons, if you can imagine. That is so sad. Mm -hmm. So obviously, they're not getting up to run away. They can't. They physically cannot. Were there other people there? Yes. Nurses and such. Finally, they were able to bribe an errand boy to secretly send a cable to their old nanny, Margaret Conway. Oh, good. She had been with their family for over 25 years. So he sent the wire to Honolulu where it reached Miss Conway, and she did make arrangements to come. But the reply cable she sent back saying that she was coming was intercepted by Dr. Hazard. So she knew that the girls were about to leave her care. So she arrives at the dock to meet Miss Conway when she arrives. And she tried to dissuade her from coming, reportedly telling her the girls no longer wished for her assistance. Mm. Miss Conway, not she like, again, she was the hired help for years. She wasn't really a person of authority. Sure. And she wasn't rich. And this was a doctor, quote unquote, doctor. Yeah. So she didn't feel like she was in a position of power to like demand it. Right. Because back then. Yeah. Stations in life mattered. Exactly. But thankfully for her, when she saw the girls and the state they were in, she immediately contacted their uncle 
and his name was Mr. Herbert or Mr. H. Herbert. He was in Portland. She sends him a cable asking oh, him good. to come and check on things. Yes, thankfully. Great. Unfortunately, oh, no. <laughs> before Uncle Herbert arrived, Claire's body, severely malnourished and no longer able to sustain itself, gave in to starvation, and she died on May 19th, 1911, weighing less than 50 pounds at the time of death. That is horrifying. Yeah. Starving to death is no easy. That would be a horrible way to die. That would be so painful. It would. Yes. I mean, you know how your stomach hurts and how nauseous you feel when you go for like a day without food. Right. And and then it causes all like, you know, you get dehydrated, mm-hmm. you have horrible headaches. I mean, lots of things accompany yeah. that. And like pains like they, you know, whenever I go for a long time without food, my back will hurt. And then Weeks. add into that that they're malnourished at this point, too. So when your body is depleted of vitamins, like, you know, your hair starts falling mm-hmm. out, all these other things happen. Your Your health fails very quickly. Yeah. Interestingly enough, Claire's autopsy stated that she had expired from cirrhosis of the liver. And this was just a little side note. Later on, they found out that gold fillings and crowns in her teeth had been pulled out and sold to a local dentist. Oh, my goodness. This lady is evil. Evil. Just a short time later, the surviving sister, Dora, she executed a power of attorney to Dr. Hazard's husband, Samuel Hazard, authorizing him to access the entirety of her money that was deposited in the Canadian Bank of Commerce in Victoria, British Columbia. Now, I cannot figure out why she did that. I mean, I wonder if if, if they really did do these things or if this doctor just had friends who... That, Stay tuned. Okay. That you might find out. On this same date... Dr. Linda Hazard filed a petition at probate court to be appointed as the guardian of Dorothea Williamson. Her- okay, what about, where's the uncle? Well, he hasn't gotten there yet. Okay. You know, he, he didn't just hop in his car and drive yeah. over, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he's on his way. Her petition outlined the inv- invalid status of Dora, claiming that she was mentally unstable and could not care for herself. The petition was approved, and now the doctor was named Dora's guardian. That is absolutely crazy yes and since dora was considered to be incompetent she was not even notified of the proceedings that had happened Mm. while claire williamson had expired under the care of linda hazard it was still not yet too late for dora she was in bad health to be sure their uncle was on his way and he brought with him a dr van derlin they arrived at olala and tried to have dora released But Dr. Hazard would not relent, as she was now the guardian. Right. She presented him with a bill for $2,000, and she refused to let Dora leave unless it was paid. Uncle Herbert was able to negotiate for a reported $1,000, and Dora was released in his care. He did state later that he did so unwillingly, but at this point, he felt with that guardianship in place, it Mm -hmm. was the only way to get her out. Well, he must have really loved his niece because a thousand dollars was a lot of money back exactly. then. Exactly. Okay, I just had to know how much mm-hmm. you know a thousand dollars was was worth. So in today's money, that would have been over thirty two thousand dollars. Wow. So he was a good uncle. Yes, he was. And imagine she wanted twice that. Oh my gosh! What that's a crazy. greedy thing. Greed for sure. Oh, also, it's interesting to note that Doctor Hazard was wearing a dress that belonged to Claire. And Claire's favorite hat when she met with Uncle Herbert. What? Yeah. She had already helped herself to her clothes and things. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Dora may have been free, but she was not in the clear. She was literally at death's door herself, weighing only a scant 60 pounds. An investigation into her sister's death was already in the works. The British vice consul, Lucien Agassiz, and attorney Frank Kelly were beginning to look deeper into the activities of Linda and Samuel Hazard. And what came to light was unbelievable. So this was a joint effort between the husband and wife? Yes. Okay. First, Agassiz and Frank Kelly appeared in court to contest the administratorship of Linda Hazard over the affairs of the assisters and their finances. Yeah. Hazard had positioned herself to control that estate, and to control Dora. Dora even claimed 
in testimony that Mrs. Hazard had tried to convince her that she was mentally unstable and had on many occasions subtly hinted at her to take her own life. Oh, my goodness. They were up on the side of like a big mountain and there was like a gully, a ravine off right off the side of the porch, I guess. And she would say to her stuff like, I've had patients that just threw themselves to their death there. Because and probably with the suf- with the amount of suffering that she was going through, mm-hmm. it might have been tempting. And the doctor knew yes. that it would have been tempting. Yes. And, and that, she probably wasn't in her right mind. But she did have the wherewithal to realize what that, was going that on. she's hinting at this. Yeah. As the investigation deepened, they realized that the Williamson sisters were not the only wealthy patients who had signed their estates over to the doctor's control. Really? There had been many others, and suspiciously, many of them were also dead. Wow. And they had the money to to build that big sanitarium. They did. And the body count was adding up. It was beginning to look like Dr. Hazard may well indeed be a serial killer. Here is a list of deceased patients of hers. In 1908, Ida Wilcox, Mrs. Elgin Cox, and a Daisy Maud Hagland Mm. died under her care. In 1909, Blanche... Oh my gosh, that's one year? Yeah, it was one year. In 1909, Blanche Tyndall, Viola Heaton, and Eugene Wakeland. Now, Eugene Wakeland, he was the son of a British lord, mm-hmm. so he supposedly was had lots of money and wealth. His body was actually found on, her, on uh, Hazard's property with a gunshot wound from a presumed suicide. Hazard had power attorney over his estate... Mm. And it was speculated later that either she had shot him or had her husband to shoot him when they found out he didn't actually have any money of his own. It all belonged to his family. And they had inflicted all this suffering on him and couldn't let his family know. Yes. Wow. In 1910, Maud Whitney and a Mr. Earl Erdman. Now, Earl Erdman was a city civil engineer who died at Seattle General Hospital of Starvation. His death came on the heels of following Dr. Hazard's cure, and he had kept a journal outlining the treatment in the days leading up to his death. Oh, good. You can read I it mean, online. I'm sad, but he that, was, that happened to him, but I'm so glad he documented it. Yeah. He would literally list like he had had like some tea and an orange. Like that was it. Like he was having nothing. When he died, headlines actually said, woman MD kills another patient. Really? And that was in 1910. The year before the Williams so they, sisters. So there were al- already some suspicions surrounding this yes. so-called doctor. Authorities actually tried to step in after Earl Erdman's death. But since Dr. Hazard was licensed and her patients were willingly participating in the cure, it didn't go anywhere. Oh, wow. And then 1911, Frank Southard, C.A. Harrison, Ivan Flux, he died with just $70 to his name after Hazard got control of his assets. Louis Rader. Oh, my gracious. So the land's getting brave. The land where she built that sanitarium actually belonged to that Louis Rader. And he was actually a former state legislator. Mm. It and, does take some nerve to do that to, to wealthy people, especially back then. Yes. You have to you be have really so good power. at manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally, Claire Williamson, which is the death that got her truly investigated. Mm. That is crazy. All of these victims died of starvation. But if the death certificate was filled out by Dr. Hazard, then various causes of death would be listed. If the autopsy was performed elsewhere and other medical professionals filled out the death certificate, the cause was always listed as starvation. Mm -hmm. So it was Claire's death and her uncle's investigation into Hazard's part in it that instigated the investigation into this greedy, evil woman. On August 5th, 1911, Mrs. Linda Hazard was arrested and charged with the willful murder of Miss Claire Williamson. She was held under a $10,000 bail at Port Orchard. That's a lot of money. On August 11th, Mrs. Hazard was arraigned on the charges and given until August 26th to make her plea. In addition, a $25,000 civil suit was filed against her by Dorothea Williamson. And even while awaiting trial... Two more of her patients died what? while succumbing themselves to her treatments. Okay, 
So who was there? The husband? Yes. Was back there and I guess all the nurses. She had she had some nurses staff. on staff. And actually her son was older now and he worked there for her too. So mm-hmm. I, at some point he had met back up with his mother, but I couldn't get full details about that. Okay. So in 1912, while she's waiting this, Ida Anderson and Mary Bailey died under her care. And both of them knew she was being tried for this. And yet they both continued to seek her medical advice and they followed it all the way to their deaths. She was a manipulator. She was sure. good at what she did yeah. for sure. Not it reminds me of like care. men in prison who seduce like, you know, these guards who know that they're in there for yes. murdering their girlfriends or something. And yet they still, yes. Yeah, but they still fall for it. Yeah. I know. I don't understand that. Or he didn't do it. I would really like he, to think. He was think, a victim. Yeah. I would really like to think I wouldn't be that gullible. But I don't know. These people are so good at manipulation. I'm gullible, so I don't know. (laughs) It was January 1912 when Linda Hazard was tried for first-degree murder of Claire the year prior. Dorothea was the star witness for the prosecution. And on the stand, she detailed parts of the treatment, that's air quotes under around that, that they had received from Mrs. Hazard. Well, I'm glad she lived. Because she she almost died. She was very close. I'm sure. 60-something pounds. Listen to this. She described being vigorously slapped by the hands. Yes, that was part of the treatment. There was other testimony of being subjected to hot baths that scalded to the touch of witnesses hearing the girls yell out in pain when being given those enemas. That's disgusting. And it's reported, this is crazy. It is reported that some witnesses had once seen Dr. Hazard pummeling a patient upon the forehead, shouting, Eliminate! Eliminate! Oh. In an attempt to cleanse their bowels. What? So, okay, th- did she believe this craziness? Well, th- I'm going to ask you that question at the end of this episode. Okay. Okay. Then came the testimony of the financial fraud. Accusations of forgery of checks and even Miss Claire Williamson's will. Mm. You asked about that. You're mm-hmm. very intuitive because you asked that just a few minutes ago about did they really do this? Uncle Herbert even testified about the fact that he had questioned whether the body he had been shown was actually his niece's body. He said it did not look like her, that the hair and lashes were lighter in hue. He couldn't tell about the eye color as those had been closed. When asked if he had mentioned those suspicions to anyone else, he admitted he had mentioned that to their nanny, Miss Conway, who had agreed with him that this body they were shown did not look like Claire. Because hmm. they were shown one that did not look as emaciated. Oh, so another, somebody else. This lady, wow. So it's here that I'm going to stop calling her doctor. Yeah. Because she was not a doctor. No. Although, during her trial, she snapped at reporters, I have told you time and time again that it is Dr. Hazard. Mrs. Hazard is my mother-in-law. Whoa. Yeah. During the trial, she complained that she was just being attacked by the medical fraternity for offering a faster cure than na- through her natural treatment. Oh, yeah, it was a faster cure, yeah. right? Faster way to heaven. Yeah. She said she was being made the scapegoat because she was a woman in a man's field and was not respected by them. She insisted the patients who died in her care were going to die anyway, which is why they were being treated. She had just not been able to help them in time because they were too far gone by the time she started. The sisters are proof that that's not true. Exactly. She offered many excuses and justifications. Again, she she really played that victim card during her trial. Mm -hmm. She probably did believe that like she was a victim. Oh, I'm sure. Another one of her quotes to the reporters is, I intend to get on the stand and show up that bunch. They've been playing checkers, but it's my move. I'll show them a thing or two when I get on the stand. Whoa. Okay. (laughs) So she seems a little angry about it, too. Now, to be sure, there were some that were in her corner still. Some testified her treatments had indeed cured them of their various illnesses. John Hagland, he was the husband of one of her first victims. I had named off Daisy Hagland. Even after his wife died, he testified he had taken his son Ivor to her for treatment three times a week after the death of his wife. That's confusing because if the husband was still alive, it wasn't like she, that is, that's weird. Your wheels are turning. Yeah. All right. So keep listening. 
During the trial, Mrs. Hazard was admonished by the judge for coaching and signaling to various defense witnesses, sometimes nodding when they were saying what she wished for them to say or giving them a look when they were not saying the right things okay. and using hand gestures. And she got in trouble for that a few times by the judge. She was just you know, brazen about it, really. And one defense witness was accused of trying to bribe a former sanator- sanitarium nurse in favor of Mrs. Hazard. Oh, wow. The trial wrapped up, and on February the 4th, 1912, after 20 hours of deliberation by the jury, Linda Burfield Hazard was found guilty of manslaughter in the death of Claire Williamson. Manslaughter? Just manslaughter. So That's crazy. They said that the jury, none of the jury doubted that she was responsible for the death. Nobody said she's not guilty. Okay. They just couldn't agree on the extent of her um, I mean, part I would, in it. I would think, though, having them sign over their assets and their money, that that's the proof. That's pretty incriminating. Yeah. But they couldn't agree on it. Okay. So she got guilty of manslaughter. So she was sentenced to the state penitentiary at Walla Walla to serve anywhere. Her sentence could be anywhere between two and 20 years. Hopefully she got the latter. She just got two years. (sighs) Two years into her sentence, she was released. And the following year, Governor Ernest Lister even gave her a full pardon. What? Yes. With the agreement that she would leave the state. So she did. And went somewhere else and opened up another place? That's exactly what she did. (laughs) Of course. She and her husband, Samuel, then moved to New Zealand, where they continued to practice. Now, she had lost her medical license, so she practiced as a dietitian and an osteopath until 1920. So although she had lost that medical license, she still referred to herself as a physician. She put a, a plaque up that even said... Uh, I think it said physician of osteopath. Wow. And while there, she published another book. She actually ended up publishing two more books and made a lot of money from those books. Enough money to regain ownership of her property at Wilderness Heights. Oh, my gracious. So they moved back. But she wasn't supposed to. But she did. Okay. Back in Olala, she was able to get back on her feet, and she brazenly opened a new sanitarium, a bigger and a better one. Where now, did she get the money? From those books that oh, she published. Okay. Well, at least it wasn't murders. So since she's back in the States, she can't really refer to herself as a physician, mm-hmm. and she can't even really call this like a sanitarium. A, yeah. So she calls it a school of health. Mm. This was weird. I thought this was kind of creepy. The new building contained its own basement autopsy room, almost as if she knew more patients would die under her care. And they did. She continued starving patients. Can you believe that? No. In the mid-1920s, she was arrested again for practicing medicine without a license after Leonard Ritter died under her care. At the time of his death, he only weighed 100 pounds. And although she was found guilty again, she was only fined $100. She didn't even receive jail time for it. I'm so confused. So she said that she was, you know, being uh, like she was like the martyr because she was this woman. But I'm like, I think you're getting away with murder because you're a woman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think a lot of people, a lot of women back then got away with murder because they were women. Yes. They were the weaker sex. And so they Mm -hmm. didn't have quite the same punishment. Right. Then in 1935, disaster struck at Starvation Heights. I mean, Wilderness Heights. (laughs) (laughs) Somehow a fire started, and before help could contain it, the sanitarium burned to the ground. Thankfully. Yeah. Linda Hazard's dream was gone. Up in smoke, literally. And mentally, they say that just destroyed her. It was definitely an odd twist of events. Three years after the fire, the now 70-year-old pseudo-doctor... She took ill herself. Hmm. In a last attempt to prove her cure, she took it upon herself. She spent days barking orders at her help, having enemas administered to herself, and wasting away all the while. Until one morning, her husband Sam found her cold, starved body expired in the upstairs bedroom. The doctor, quote unquote, who had set out to heal herself, had administered her final treatment. 
Wow. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. Yep. So what do you think? Do you think she did that with the intent to steal money? Or do you think she really believed in her cure? I don't know now. That that last little bit, that was a twist. Um, I think maybe she convinced herself that these patients were going to die anyway. And she maybe she did believe in her cure. I don't know. Unless she just went crazy there at the end. Yeah. I don't know. This is what I think. I think she was super confident in her abilities. I think she really thought she was a doctor and that she knew more or as much as medically trained Mm -hmm. doctors. I think she was a little arrogant in that respect. Yeah. I also think she saw an opportunity and took it. Yeah. Because she was seeing lots of wealthy people. Right. And when they would get really sick and she did need money to build that dream Mm -hmm. for sanitarium. I think when the opportunity presented itself, she took full advantage of it. Yeah. That's... But but I think she did believe in herself that much. I think she was that arrogant that she thought she knew it all and would not see any other option other than that I've got the cure. Wow. Oh, my goodness. That's just my opinion. Yeah. No, that, that totally makes sense. That is insane. Yeah. I love that. I mean, it's a sad story, <laughs> but it was a good one. So those were some hard times. Those were some crazy times. Now, I'm sure after listening to this episode, you think you've discovered the miracle cure to life's ailments. But before you shut the blinds and lock the doors and pump 15 quarts of yogurt up your rectum, make sure you tell everybody you know and a few people you don't to check out Hard Times and True Crimes. Till next time, goodbye.